Hello, this is the start of our virtual seminar on modeling biocomplexity with a focus on cancer innovation and progression. My name is Andreas Deutsch, together with Lutz Brusch, I'm heading the department innovative methods of computing within the Center for Information Services and High Performance Computing at the Dresden University. Yes. There's a technical issue, sorry for the interruption. I hope you can hear me. I would like to introduce the other organizers of the seminar, Simon Süger and Robert Müller, who are also members of our department. We have roughly 300 people now following the seminar via all sorry again for the technical problem. I just uh, started to say that we have now roughly 300 interested uh, people following the seminar series. These are distributed all over the world. We have uh, Maximar in Germany, in United States, United Kingdom, Italy and Spain. And Dresden is located somewhere in the yellow region, which you see over here on the eastern part of Germany, roughly 200 kilometers from Berlin, the capital. And today it's a particular pleasure to welcome Natalia Komarova. And before she starts her presentation, I would like to introduce Natalia shortly. Natalia Komarova studied physics at Moscow State University with a master degree and completed her PhD at the University of Arizona. Her dissertation topic, essays on nonlinear waves patterns underwater, pulse propagation through random media. After postdoctoral research at the University of Warwick, Institute of Advanced Study and the University of Chicago Chicago, she became a lecturer at the University of Leeds, United Kingdom, and moved back to the United States to Rutgers, and shortly after to the University of California at Irvine, where she is still today a professor in mathematics. She has uh, many interests, and I would say a common interest of you is evolution. You were introduced and are still introduced, uh, interested in evolution of languages and in the last years, very much in cancer evolution. There are three books written by you on cancer aspects. And today you will present your work on mathematical modeling of cancer evolution. We are very much looking forward to your presentation. Before you start, I would like to introduce the listeners. You can uh, formulate questions in the chat, uh, both in Zoom and in YouTube. We collect the chats and will also probably allow live questions in the discussion. But now I have spoken enough 
and would like to welcome you again. Uh, Natalia, thanks for coming to our seminar and presenting your work on cancer evolution. Thank you. Please Thank you so start much. your presentation. Thank you so much for this nice introduction. And I would like to thank uh, Andreas Deutsch and other organizers for inviting me. This is the first time I speak uh, uh, under uh, this uh, framework and uh, I hope it goes well. So let me share a uh, screen and uh, we'll go from there. Mm. Okay. So, I hope you can see it. Uh, let me know if there are any technical difficulties. And now we'll start. So we'll talk about mathematical modeling of cancer evolution. And uh, here's my uh, perhaps slightly too ambitious program for today. I will introduce two types of common patterns that exist in cancer. They are related to the types of mutations that are observed. They're called uh, broadly loss of function and gain of function mutations. So roughly my talk will have two parts. Um, with loss of function mutations, we'll talk about the role of passenger mutations and uh, the speed of evolution in cancer. And in the second part about gain of function mutations, we'll talk about the role of aspirin in cancer prevention then I'll introduce uh, this very novel uh, new, new, new work that uh, we just finished, Mutants in Expanding Colonies. And I'll conclude by talking about random environments. So uh, here's a um, famous uh, schematic that depicts the start of colon cancer. So we go from normal cells through several st steps to uh, cancerous tissue. Each step, is a, a mutation, right? And there are uh, about seven mutational steps, they say, uh, that uh, take uh, tissue all the way to cancer. And uh, I particularly wanna attract your attention to the first couple of steps. Uh, the first one is uh, in, an inactivation of an APC gene. That's a very early event, uh, well before a person knows that uh, anything is wrong. And the second one is an uh, activation of a KRAS gene. So these are actually examples of the two types of mutations I will be talking about. The first one is a, a loss of function and the second is a gain of function mutation. So what are these? A gain of function mutation is when you have uh, a cell um, and uh, it undergoes a mutation, uh, something changes in the genome and this mutation actually changes uh, the properties of the cell in such a way that, for example, uh, it becomes invasive, it doesn't want to cooperate, it wants to grow, expand, something like this. So uh, a common example is so-called oncogenes, like the KRAS gene that I just mentioned in the context of colon cancer. So one mutation and the properties of the, the cell change enough such that it starts making a difference, right? The second type, loss of function mutation, is very different. So uh, it involves the so-called tumor suppressor genes. These are the genes that kind of keep the cell from doing bad things. And as you know, each gene is represented twice in each cell in, on two chromosomes. So the first event is an inactivation of the first copy of that gene, right? So this is gone, it doesn't work, but there is still the other copy and it keep, keeps, continues doing its job. It's still keeping the cell from uh, being um, uh, an invader, for example. So uh, it takes two mutational events to inactivate both copies. And only then do we see uh, the effect of this mutation. So it's, it's essentially a two-step process. Uh, and so in the end, both copies of the tumor suppressor gene are inactivated and the cell, uh, for example, can start growing, expanding, breaking all the rules, right? So today we'll actually start with the second type of mutation, 
uh, loss of function and then move on to uh, gain of function. So uh, this is usually discussed uh, in terms of fitness. So we start from a normal cell that has a certain fitness, uh, which is kind of the propensity the, the, with which uh, it uh, divides, right? Uh, undergoes a turnover in the tissue. Uh, and the inactivation of the first copy of the tumor suppressor gene doesn't make the cell grow. In fact, it can make it slower because you know there is a lot of functions that this uh, gene may have. By deleting that gene, uh, we may lose other functions. So the cell can actually lose fitness. Right? And then when the second copy of the gene is inactivated, there is a huge gain in fitness and the cell becomes a dangerous cell. Right? So it goes from normal fitness down and then to hugely up. Right? There are other scenarios where it doesn't go down uh, or just even slightly increases in fitness in this intermediate step. But uh, this is probably a more common scenario. And uh, uh, usually the mathematical question that we ask is what is the probability by, that by a certain time, this, uh, both of these events have happened and the two hit mutant has been created. It's instructive to discuss this uh, in a broader evolutionary context of complex traits. So let me explain. What is a complex trait? Every, almost everything we have uh, as uh, creatures that have been created by evolution is a complex trait. Here is an example of a bacterium fl flagellum, right? This is a thing that the bacterium uses to swim. It's complex. How did it evolve on the first place? So presumably uh, there were wild type bacteria that did not have a flagellum and could not swim. And somehow they evolved in such a way that they uh, were able to swim. So they acquired this complex new organ that makes them you know, propel themselves. It consists of many parts like the previous slide show. So presumably to go from here to there, a bacterium had to acquire some sort of a partial flagellum that didn't really work, so here. So you can see clearly that to, to go from here to here, before it gets better, it gets necessarily worse. So uh, this is what they call a crossing of the fitness valley. Before it becomes better, it becomes worse. The second example comes from economics. Uh, this is a picture that I took from a book that talks about uh, uh, change, uh, changing rules of economics in the digital age or something like this. And the example is an Encyclopedia Britannica. They used to only exist on paper, hard copies, right? And then when the new times came, they had to rethink how they operate. They had to go on a digital platform. It was difficult. Uh, every time you start something new, it doesn't work. So before it get, got better, it got worse. So in economics, uh, uh, economics entities also have to sometimes cross this fitness valley. It gets worse before it gets better. And of course, in cancer, the example of uh, uh, a tumor suppressor gene that I just described uh, is a prime example of that. It gets worse when you inactivate the first copy of the tumor suppressor gene, and then it, it gets better. As a consequence of that, of, of, this, of having to cross the fit, fitness valley, uh, it takes a very long evolutionary time to actually create a double hit mutant because the single hit mutants are so low in fitness, they die so easily. They have to be created over and over be before they become successful. So it, become, it, it becomes a big problem for evolution to actually find those uh, you know, fit solutions that take more than one step. So this is uh, a mathematical problem that uh, we, we try to address. And let me show you a couple of examples of how this can be done uh, by using the example of uh, tumor suppressor genes. So the first um, the dynamical system that I describe, um, it's a stochastic process, uh, what they call a Moran process. And it's probably the simplest way to represent tissue. So let's suppose you have a bunch of cells in the box and we kill one, so one dies, and there, there, there is space opens up and another cell divides and takes place of the other cell, right? So this is supposed to model cellular 
turnover in healthy tissue. The population of cells is always constant, right? And it just keeps going. And every time a cell divides, there is a probability that a mutation happens. And one hit mutant can give rise to a two hit mutant. So how is it? How does it work, right? So uh, we can model this uh, and solve this process. Um, and uh, we discover that there are three distinct dynamical regimes that happen. So if the mutation rate is very low compared to the uh, inverse population size, uh, we have a very simple picture. So first, the whole tissue, of course, consists of normal cells. Then after a long time, uh, a mutant, a one hit mutant is created. And even though it's disadvantageous, it comes to dominate, probably because the population is small here. And then after another long stretch of time, another mutation happens that actually creates the super mutant, the double hit mutant, and it wins. So it's a two-step process. This happens either for very small mutation ra uh, uh, rates or for very small populations. The second regime is what we call stochastic tunneling. Here, uh, these disadvantageous mutants uh, are created, but they never come to dominate. They kind of linger at low numbers. Here is a, uh, it's an exponential, uh, it's a long scale, right? There are only a few of them. And then one of them develops a second hit and the second, uh, two hit mutant comes to dominate. And the third regime uh, is when the population is huge or mutation rate is huge and it's almost deterministic. So here we will concentrate on this intermediate regime, which seems to be you know, biologically most relevant for most uh, for many systems, stochastic tunneling. And uh, we will calculate how quickly, depending on the parameters, uh, a super mutant, a mutant with two mutations can be created. Uh, I will not dwell on math here. And I just say that this rate, the rate of tunneling, can be used as a proxy for the speed of evolution. And in many uh, systems it can be calculated. So for this particular process, the process that is very primitive, that has no space, that has no structure, this is the calculation that gives you this rate in terms of parameters of the system. Let's just keep in mind that we can do this. And now add a little bit more realism to the system. So this is not realism yet, but it's space, right? So instead of putting all the cells uh, in kind of like completely mixed system where they don't know where they are, we put them in a spatial, on a spatial grid. Here's an example of a one dimensional spatial grid. So it's just a line and uh, it can be done in more dimensions. And uh, so now the Moran process is like this. You kill a cell and it's replaced by the progeny of one of its neighbors like this, right? So it keeps going like this. So in this one dimensional system, the mutation rate can be calculated and it turns out to be faster than in the system without space. So somehow space, spatial interactions accelerate evolution. So we first did it in 1D uh, and then uh, it, it was done uh, in higher dimensions by us and by other people. Uh, and so, yeah, you can envisage that it works in the same way. One cell uh, is killed and is replaced by the progeny of its neighbors. And again, uh, the rate of evolution is significantly higher in the spatial system. So uh, these, are, these pictures represent simulations. And uh, you can see th they look different, right? So red uh, are normal cells. Uh, and light blue are one hit mutants, those disadvantageous weak mutants that are sometimes randomly created, which eventually will give rise to a super mutant, right? So in, in a non-spatial system, uh, everything is mixed together. So a cell dies and the, that spot can be replaced by a progeny of any other cell. So they, they don't know where they are. So you can see that these mutants uh, are kind of interspersed. They're everywhere. In a spatial simulation, only neighbors can replace empty spots, right? And you can see that mutants, once created, they kind of live on these islands, right? Because uh, a, a mutant gives rise to another mutant and they kind of spread as spots. And you see uh, mutants, weak, disadvantageous mutants, feel a lot better uh, in the spatial system. Why? 
they cluster together, right, because of these spatial restrictions, because of the fact that they can only reproduce to the spot next to them. So they're, they're huddled together and uh, they end up only competing for space with their neighbors. Here on the left in the well-mixed system, they compete with everybody. So if a weak, disadvantageous one-hit mutant competes with stronger normal cells, it's likely to lose. Here, if a mutant competes with some of other mutants, uh, it feels better, right? It has a larger chance to reproduce. So uh, in the presence of space, uh, weak mutants cuddle together, they feel more advantageous, they survive for longer, and therefore they give rise to super mutant faster because of the larger presence of weak mutants one hit mutants in the system. Okay, so that's an explanation of why space accelerates evolution. Okay, rate of evolution is faster in any dimension. Uh, now, th the third example is uh, adding some more realism. Uh, it's a hierarchical structure. You know that uh, in tissues, cells are not all the same. And this is the simplest representation of what may happen in tissues. Um, a stem cell sits at the bottom, right? And uh, it, when it divides, it can differentiate, become more uh, kind of like a working cell. Um, and so the process uh, can be simulated like this. The, st the top layer of cells dies. It's done its job, right? These are differentiated cells. They go away. The previous layer divides and moves up and the freeze space for the previous layer that divides and moves up and like this. And finally, the stem cell divides and replenishes uh, the, the space. So this is what we call the hierarchical Moran process. And in this case, the rate of evolution can also be calculated and it's slower, slower than in space and slower than in the simplest mass action well-mixed system. So uh, what we see is this hierarchy of rates. Uh, in the middle, there is a well-mixed system. A spatial model creates the highest, the, the, uh, moves evolution in, in the fastest way. And the hierarchical model with stem cells and lineages uh, evolves uh, at the lowest rate. So, uh, to conclude this part, two-hit mutant creation is fastest in rigid spatially restricted system. Uh, two-hit mutant creation is slowest in hierarchical populations. Uh, and it's even slower than in a simple mass action process. And perhaps this is the reason for the hierarchical structure of our organs, right? We are products of evolution. We have evolved to delay and avoid cancer as much as possible. So it doesn't hit us before we had, had the chance to reproduce. And maybe that's why tissue is organized this way, because this is a mathematical way to slow down evolution, right? So this is uh, something that uh, uh, we can extract from these processes by, by just doing mathematics. Okay, so uh, the example that I want to show in, in this regard is uh, tumor heterogeneity. So uh, if you follow the, the um, theory of um, cancer, you know that uh, there are two types of uh, mutations that are distinguished sometimes, um, driver mutations and passenger mutations. So driver mutations are the ones that confer selective advantage to cells and enable them to break out of uh, cooperation, start evolving, start dividing the bad part, the, the bad, bad mutations. These are oncogenes. These are tumor suppressor genes that I already mentioned. There are other mutations that uh, fall in this class. They drive cancer on. And there are, on the other hand, passenger mutations. They're usually deleterious. They don't do anything. They, they may kill the cell. They may make, make it weaker. They do not directly contribute to the disease, OK? Uh, and of course, uh, people mostly concentrate on driver mutations because they drive cancer and usually ignore passenger mutations. So in what follows, I'll show you that passenger mutations can be important. And uh, uh, 
we look at the inactivation of a tumor suppressor gene. First, the first copy is inactivated, then the second copy is inactivated. This is the cell that starts expanding, that starts growing. This is the beginning of uh, malignant transformation. So it's a two-step process. Let's add the possibility of passenger mutations. So all this first row is a driver mutation, right? It drives it forward. It has um, a goal, right, of achieving this, um, you know, super phenotype. Uh, and these are just random hits that just lower the fitness of the cells, just randomly. And again, in these cells that are affected by passenger mutations, you have to go through the both steps, inactivate the first and the second copy of the tumor suppressor gene. So in this hypothetical framework, we pretend that it's possible to go without passenger mutations. We already know that they happen actually, so this is impossible. But let's theoretically compare a pathway that doesn't involve passenger mutations with a pathway that does and calculate the speed of evolution. And it turns out that this way is faster, even though it looks like a circumvent way. But uh, if you calculate the rate of evolution, it goes faster in the presence of passenger mutations. Why is that? because passenger mutations lower the overall fitness of the cell population. And you know that it, to go from normal to double hit mutant, we have to pass through a fitness valley, lower the fitness. And if the overall fitness is lower, then the valley becomes shallower, so you can cross it faster, okay? So do we have a, a, these passenger mutations speed up uh, evolution? and um, actually accelerate the cancerous transformation. Uh, so it's easier to cross the fitness valley. So this, sim this simulation show uh, how big the effect is, right? Fold acceleration, depending on the parameters, you can have a 50% acceleration, eight fold acceleration and so on. But uh, really uh, in order to uh, see how important this effect is, I want to compare it with something that actually uh, is known uh, as an accelerating effect of cancer. It's called the Lynch syndrome. This is a germline mutation in one of the copies of the mismatch repair gene uh, that makes the cells unstable. They mutate faster, right? Uh, and uh, uh, people that are affected this uh, by, by this uh, condition usually uh, on average develop colon cancer uh, by the age of 45 compared to 60 for on average uh, with people without this condition. So the way it works in such people, it takes one mutation to achieve this mutation phenotype where mutations happen very fast. And then from here you go fast because you mutate faster, right? So one normal step and two fast steps. So it turns out that this is faster so th this is the pathway that normal people have, the people are, are unaffected by the Lynch syndrome take. And this is a pathway of the Lynch syndrome. That's why it leads to cancer on average sooner for the affected uh, patients. How much faster, right? We can calculate that and compare this acceleration with the acceleration because of passenger mutations. So how large is the accelerating effect of passenger mutations? We compare it with Lynch syndrome. And if the degree of acceleration is comparable, that means that passenger mutations have clinical value, right? They, they're, they're doing something that is important. And here is a, a, a simulation that shows, so this is the acceleration uh, because of passenger mutations. And it's kind of bracketed by the acceleration from the Lynch syndrome. So it's kind of out there. It has the same order of magnitude as this uh, existing disorder. So the presence of passenger mutations can accelerate the rate of evolution by reducing overall population fitness. And uh, um, it's uh, comparable uh, with the acceleration given by this mutation, um, by this familial cancerous disorder. And passenger mutations are important and should not be ignored is they significantly affect tumor evolution and may have clinical relevance, okay? Um, so um, that concludes the first part of my talk. Now we move on to gain of function mutations. Uh, this is actually simpler. 
because it involves only one step. Uh, but I have several examples to show. Um, and I will start with a very kind of a puzzle type thing, almost like a, a exercise, a thought exercise. Let's suppose that we have N cells in a box and at each update, we remove one at random with uniform probability and then double uh, one of the other ones. And when the cell divides, right, when, when this circle doubles, it keeps its color. So this is similar to the process I already described that we use to model cellular terminal. So it kind of goes like this. We remove one and another one divides, right? Remove one and another one divides like this. So my question to you is what will happen as I keep doing this? Will this process go on forever or does it have an end? And if it has an end, a result, what is the result? Okay, since I can't hear your answer, I assume that you all guessed correctly. All the cells will turn the same color eventually, right? Uh, which color? Of course, this is random, right? It could be any color. From symmetry, uh, all colors uh, are equally likely to dominate with probability one over n, right? So, um, this is a, an important process that in, in evolutionary theory is called fixation, right? We have, uh, if all cells are orange and one is black, what is the probability that eventually everybody will be black or orange, right? Um, and th this is a well-known um, uh, uh, problem in, in, in probability and it's important for evolutionary theory. Uh, this is the probability of mutant fixation as a function of the mutant fitness R in the number of cells N. Uh, in particular, if R, the fitness of these mutants is the same as everybody else, this, when you take the limit, becomes one over N because everybody is equally likely to dominate. Uh, in fact, this is a very general uh, theory. Uh, the probability of mutant fixation, neutral mutants, mutants that have the same property as uh, normal cells, uh, it's given by how many mutants you start with divided by the total population, right? So the probability of fixation equals to the mutants or initial frequency or fraction that they have, okay? This is uh, a signature of neutrality. It means that um, if this is so, then the mutant is neutral. It doesn't have an advantage or a disadvantage. Higher or lower fixation probability indicates selection. So if the probability to fixate is less than the initial fraction, it means that the mutant is disadvantageous, like the ones that we talked be about before. If it's bigger than this fraction, then it's an advantageous mutant. Okay, so uh, I, my example uh, of how this can be useful is um, aspirin and cancer prevention. So uh, to motivate, um, I'll tell you about uh, research of John Byrne and uh, colleagues in the Great Britain. Um, they uh, studied uh, how, uh, whether aspirin could uh, delay or prevent uh, cancer in Lynch syndrome patients. We already mentioned uh, the Lynch syndrome. This is when you're predisposed to have cancer. Uh, and uh, so in, in the experiment that they uh, conducted, they gave little baby aspirin tablets to uh, one group of patients, Lynch, Lynch syndrome patients, and uh, there was a control group and they traced uh, for several years uh, the development of cancer in these patients. And they found that aspirin actually helps, right? The, the, the fraction of people who developed cancer in this group was uh, smaller, okay? So it significantly helps. Uh, and uh, so uh, it has to do with inflammation, right? Because inflammation um, is related to cancer. And also, you know, that aspirin reduces inflammation. So somehow it's related. So we want to understand exactly what's going on. Uh, and uh, there is an interesting theory that uh, uh, kind of hypothesizes about mismatch repair deficiency in cancer. 
So uh, just uh, to mention this, Lynch syndrome, right? Again, what does it do? As I mentioned, uh, Lynch syndrome patients, um, their cells uh, are prone to making mistakes, right? They have a higher mutation rate. Uh, but more precisely, these cells, um, all cells make mistakes, all cells mutate, but often they go back and correct. They made a mistake, they, they proofread and then go back and correct. These cells don't, right? they don't stop to repair uh, the damage and just keep going without correction. So th this is what they call mismatch repair deficiency. Okay, uh, so how is this uh, connected with cancer? So uh, in this paper, there was an interesting theory uh, about the DNA damage and repair. So let's suppose we have two cars. This car, uh, uh, the driver of this car rather, uh, takes care of uh, their car. They always stop to check. And if something is wrong, they repair and they keep going. This car, it's full of damage, right? But it's still kind of going, but slower, right? So obviously we are all like this, right? We, we take care of our cars so we can drive better. Now, let's suppose that there is a lot of damage that is going on. You see this person is uh, sprinkling the cars with bullets or whatever damage. Uh, so this guy will always be stuck in the checkpoint. He will be always repairing his car while this will be trotting along, right? So the uh, theory goes that in the presence of a lot of damage, which is of course mutagen, those cells that don't stop to repair will acquire a selective advantage and they will win, okay? They will come to fixation. Okay, so uh, we wanted to check that by doing it theoretically and mathematically. Uh, so we designed a simple model so there are two types of cells. Normal cells go through stages, a couple of stages, and uh, they always stop to repair. They check, they have this checkpoint that they always uh, attend and they repair. Uh, and these are non-arresting cells. They never stop to repair. So these are really different um, uh, life cycles, right? Uh, normal cells have an additional stage where they stop and check. Okay. And I want to see what are the evolutionary advantages or disadvantages uh, enjoyed by these mutants. Okay. How do we check? So first we uh, let both types of cells grow, obviously in a computer. Uh, and the non-arresting cells, the mutants that don't stop, grow faster. Okay. And then they, they fill the population so the, uh, in these two simulations, uh, they were grown separately, right? These will grow faster. So perhaps the mutants are advantageous. Okay, let's check in a different way. Uh, we put a bunch of uh, cells of both types in the same population and look uh, who wins. And it turns out that nobody wins. Here, uh, they just kind of linger around at the same level. So perhaps they're neutral. And there's a third way, and this has to do with fixation that I described earlier. So remember we said that if the probability for a given mutant to come to fixation is equal to its original frequency, then this neutral mutant is neutral, okay? If it's smaller than that, it's disadvantageous. If it's large enough, it's advantageous. So let's check this non-arresting cells, do they enjoy advantage? Do they come to fixation at the, at the probability larger than predicted for the neutral theory? And it turns out that no, they actually get fixated. They win less often than they should, which means that there are disadvantages. So this is interesting. The three different uh, ways of addressing this question, three different answers, but we are interested in fixation. So uh, somehow the theory doesn't quite hold. Cells that don't stop to repair don't seem to enjoy, enjoy an advantage when they're competing against normal cells. Uh, so I'll skip the math. Uh, so how does it work? Why does aspirin help to prevent cancer? 
So let's think about this process. We have inflammation. All the cells always experience, uh, you know, attack uh, of damage from inflammation. And inflammation is damaging. It causes mutations, right? Uh, so um, why do these cells come to fixation if they are not? Uh, we just proved that they were not uh, advantageous. So uh, there is one more component that was missing from our description we need a mechanism of pulsation, periodic attack of damage. So you damage a cell or a population, a bunch of cells in a population, then you let go, let them grow. Damage, let them grow. So with, with this periodic forcing, we actually let the cells decrease and then grow and then decrease and then grow. And only then do these non-arresting cells experience advantage. So in the face of periodic damage by inflammation, non-arresting cells, like the cells that exist in the Lynch uh, syndrome patients, will grow. They experience an advantage. They come to dominate, and then they lead to further mutations that uh, actually cause cancer. And aspirin decreases inflammation, so this process stops and the cells don't come to dominate. So this is a possible mechanism of how aspirin can prevent uh, cancer. OK, uh, so uh, let me come to uh, my favorite part. Uh, this is the newest uh, research that we just did. Oh, we just did. Uh, and it's about uh, mutants spreading through uh, expanding spatial populations. So. Um, uh, let me show you two simulations. Th these are just schematic. So we will be comparing uh, mass action systems and spatial systems. So as I already said, in a spatial system, you can only place your offspring next to you. Okay, and if all the um, grid, po uh, all the uh, points next to you are taken by other cells, you cannot reproduce. Okay, only if something dies next to you, you can put your offspring there. In the mass action or well-mixed system, you can put offspring anywhere. Okay, and uh, uh, in this part of this discussion, we will focus on growing populations. We start with one cell and let them grow out, expand, and possibly create one-hit mutants, okay? So it looks like this, right? Uh, this is, uh, these slices kind of trace the history of mutations. Uh, this is a real simulation, right? It started growing from the, uh, from the middle. The population of normal cells, blue, expanded. On its way, it creates some mutants, yellow, and they expand like slices like this. So you can see wedges uh, or closed bubbles like this when they are frozen, right? There is no death here, it just grows out. So this was uh, studied by Fosco et, et al. Uh, in 2016. Uh, and so uh, the question is uh, a comparison of creation of mutants in a growing spatial population like this uh, compared to a, a, a non-spatial population. So we start with one cell at the center, run the spatial model until the total number of cells reaches a threshold N, count the number of mutants, and then we repeat this in the well-mixed mass action model. Do we expect to have more mutants or less mutants? in the spatial compared to non-spatial model. So this question was answered in this paper. So this is our simulation, but the result. Uh, red represents the number of mutants uh, in the spatial system. Black is mass action. You can see that for any combination of divisions and death rates, there is always more mutants in space, okay? Uh, so, and the explanation uh, offered in this paper was the so-called jackpot events. These are mutations that give rise to large mutant clones. So let me explain. In mass action or in a well-mixed system, jackpot events are very rare, okay? So here we look at uh, a, a growth, exponential growth, mass action growth. We start with one cell divides into two, four, eight, 16, and so on. Uh, every time a cell divides, it, there's a small chance of mutation. If this cell divided and one of the offspring was mutant, red here, 
you can see that it gave rise to a very large clone of mutant cells, which is actually a quarter of the whole population. This is a jackpot uh, event, uh, but it can only happen in this way if a mutation happens very early on, right? The, the probability of mu mutation uh, is, can be estimated as 10 to the minus nine or 10 to the minus seven per cell division, very small. So the probability of having that among the first couple of divisions is minuscule. If it happens, it has a huge effect, but it's very, very rare because most mutations of course happen when the population is already very large at the very last stages of the exponential growth. So most mutations are like this, they don't matter. Okay, so this is what happens in an exponential non-spatial growth. Now, it turns out that in spatial systems, jackpot events can happen at any time, almost. Look at this. I give you an example of a one-dimensional growth. So you start with this cell on the left. It gives rise to one to a daughter cell. This divides and so we have this very unrealistic, but it, it illustrates the point, right? We have this unrealistic growth of cells in one line. Let's suppose it decides to mutate here. Then all the cells that happen from now on will be mutant, right? So, but the probability to mutate here or here is the same. So we can have a jackpot mutation almost at any stage. So because of spatial restrictions, it was argued that in space, uh, there are more mutants, right? So uh, we built on this theory uh, and looked at other cases, right? So we looked at advantageous mutations and disadvantageous mutations. So this is what they look like. When you have adv advantageous mutations, they're mostly wedges. There's more com compared to neutral. Disadvantageous mutants never form wedges. They, they, they are disadvantageous. There's, there are just specks like this that later on get engulfed by other cells. We did it in the presence of death. So here it's less dense. There's empty spaces between cells. Uh, still looks kind of the, cell, the same. So uh, what is the result, right? Uh, do we expect more mutants or less mutants uh, in space? So this is the neutral simulation where mutants have the same properties as uh, normal cells. Advantageous mutants, uh, hugely, uh, the, the number of cells in space is a, a lot larger than in mass action. Uh, this, in this simulation, the advantageous cells has increased division rate. In this uh, simulation, advantageous mutants had a decreased death rate. Still the same result, more mutants in spatial systems. Uh, now we look at disadvantageous mutations. Here, disadvantageous mutations have uh, decreased divisions. They divide less. Again, more mutants uh, in space. Now, disadvantageous mutants have increased death. And now it turns around. In this uh, weird case, uh, there are more mutants in mass action than in space. So something is going on that is different from jackpot mutations uh, that uh, could not be explained by th this theory. Uh, so uh, more, we have more mutants in a well-mixed system, a very surprising result, but only if mutants are disadvantageous and they die more, right? So this is mutants that are killed more than uh, the wild type cells than the normal cells. Uh, so how can we understand this? So here, here's uh, our attempt to, uh, uh, to understand it. So the, uh, we always start with ordinary differential equations, right? To understand anything. Uh, we have uh, normal cells and mutants. They divide, uh, normal cells divide and die. This is some sort of a mass action term. They mutate, they create mutants, mutants divide and die. So there are four rates, division and death rate of normal cells, division and death rate of mutants. Okay. Uh, and now we put it in, uh, so there are many names for this type of modeling, metapopulation, deems, island model. Uh, so, the, but the idea is that we have a bunch of um, little islands. Uh, inside each island, we have these ODEs and things migrate in, uh, from neighboring islands. So they're not isolated completely. There is migration, right? And we look at Gillespie simulations uh, in such a system. So it's a stochastic system. Mutations happen stochastically, right? And we look at the spread of mutations starting from one cell somewhere in the middle. 
Uh, with, uh, so the pop population of no normal cells grow and they jump to neighboring islands. Mutants grow. So it's kind of like a spatial system, but discretized like this. Uh, and so let's suppose that normal cells have division rate of one and death rate of 0.1. Okay, if we fix the parameters of the normal cells and we pick different parameters for disadvantageous mutants. So if we pick them along this line, then the mutants will have a smaller division rate. And if we pick them here, they have increased death rate. And so these are the two types of mutants that are interesting to look at. And we explore the difference between the, this island model, metapopulation model, and the model of the same size, but where everything mixes together, just the two ODEs, right? Uh, solved in Gillespie, so we have stochastic mutations. Mutations that are not always created, they're created as discrete events. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, now, um, if we look at this type of mutations with decreased divisions, we can see that in the spatial or in this model, metapopulation model, we have more mutants and that's not surprising. Now we look at these mutants and there are more mutants in mass action. So the same result, the same weird result holds when we solve ODEs in, in a, a island model. Even stranger. So this island model kind of has a spatial um, structure because cells migrate between neighboring deems. Here we destroy the spatial structure. We connect every cell, every island with every other island, and we still have almost an identical result. So it's not about space, it's about something else. It's really about fragmentation. So here we have a, a model that everybody is the same, is, is in the same pot. Here we fragment it, kind of put it into small um, islands, uh, but they don't really have a spatial structure and we still get this weird result, right? So how can we explain this? Uh, so let's look at this couple of uh, origin differential equations, ODEs, and look at the dynamics of mutants. These are disadvantageous mutants. So eventually, as time goes by, the number of mutants will in the ODE will stabilize to what they call a selection mutation balance. These are disadvantageous mutants, so they will never grow very much, but they're always created by mutations. So the, the, a balance between creation and uh, by mutations and death uh, because they are disadvantageous will create this level mutation selection balance. And so as time goes to infinity, this is your limiting behavior of the disadvantageous mutants. But the two types of mutants that we consider here behave differently. So these are two types, uh, one type of mutants are characterized by decreased divisions, they divide less and they kind of grow out and increase to this limit. On the other hand, mutants of increased death overshoot and come down. Why is that? Mutants with increased death have the same division rate as normal cells. So initially, they don't know, don't even know that they are mutants, right? They have they divide in the same way as normal cells, so they grow faster, and then the death rate kind of takes its toll and they come down like this. Uh, so here we plot the number of mutants as a function of the total population size. And you can see a very different behavior. Mutants with decreased behavior, there's different convexity, right, here. So, and that turns out to be very important. So to compare a fragmented system with a bunch of islands, with a mass action system, which has just the whole population, uh, we plot them like this. These are graphs of the total population si size of each little island. So we start with the first island, one cell there, it grows and kind of stabilizes because each island has a finite capacity. And this is, uh, eventually it migrates to some other island. So there it's delayed somewhat and it goes to capacity and so on. So these are different islands and they're all <coughs> kind of delayed with respect to each other, right? They're not synchronized. In the mass action system, in the well-mixed system, we can artificially divide the system into the same number of islands or patches. That's just a mathematical trick. We just look at one end of the population, but of course they're all in sync because they're all part of the same, right? So here there is no, they are all in sync 
and here they are desynchronized. And this is the key. So if the mutants uh, are characterized by decreased divisions, so this is the blue line here, then the maximum number of mutants, ma maximum percentage of mutants is achieved when the island is completely full. So uh, let's stop the simulation where the total population reaches a certain number. So for example, here, so we stop here, right? Uh, and here, you can see that it kind of looks different. Uh, in the mass action, all the patches are kind of half full, right? They're, they haven't reached the, the saturation yet. And in the fragmented system, some patches are completely full and some are completely empty. So go back here. In, if the mutants are characterized by decreased divisions, then the maximum percentage is achieved when the islands are full. So we are better off here. We, we reach a, a larger percentage if the, the more patches are full, the better. So we have more mutants in a fragmented system. On the other hand, if mutants are characterized by increased death, the yellow line here, the maximum percentage is when the system was only partially full. So we are better off here in the mass action system. So we have more mutants in a well-mixed system. Okay, so uh, to uh, conclude or to, to, to finish up, I want to show you something else. Uh, we developed a full theory of the growth laws of mutants in different geometries, different dimensionalities, uh, and compare that with mass action. So this uh, stands for a well-mixed system uh, where we have a, an exponential growth and we look at the two-dimensional flat front system. So look at this uh, rectangle. The cells, the front is here and the cells divide on one side like this. Uh, uh, an example of this system is a one-dimensional growth that I showed you before, just one row of cells. It, it falls here, 2D flat. 2D range is more realistic. It's a two-dimensional spot that I showed you before that grows out like this. 3D flat is a cylinder where the dividing cells are on this bottom of the cylinder going that way. 3D range is a three-dimensional sphere. This is the most realistic one that characterizes three-dimensional solid tumor that grows outward, right? So we want to look at all of these geometries and de derive the growth laws uh, of mutants. Uh, and we will look at disadvantageous neutral and advantageous mutants. Okay, so the easiest one is disadvantageous. No matter what the geometry is, uh, mutants, the number of mutants in the population of size n will scale as u, the mutation rate, times n. Okay, because mutants are created, they don't really grow, they are disadvantageous. So they are, the number of mutants will be proportional to the number of cells that are there. Easy. Uh, not so easy here, uh, but it's possible to derive laws both for neutral and advantageous mutants and compare them with well-known laws of uh, uh, exponential growth. You may know this n log n uh, result uh, of the uh, Luria-Delbruck um, distribution. This is the number of mutants in an exponentially growing colony of size n without space. space. And the, um, in space, depending on dim the dimensionality and the geometry, there are always power laws. So you can see that all of these grow faster than the, the uh, non-spatial case. We compare n log n with powers of n that are larger than one, right? Any power of n larger than one will grow faster than this. So this kind of proves that neutral mutants in any geometry will, gr will grow more uh, in a spatially distributed system compared to a mass action system. Advantageous mutants. The same thing. So here is the law. This was de derived by Yoi Wasa and colleagues. Uh, I forgot to put a reference here. Uh, so this power here has to do with uh, how advantageous they are. So it changes depending on the advantage. Not the case here, by the way. So this power is between one and two, if you if you look at it. So it it grows the power law with the law uh, with the power between one and two. Look at all these. Oh, by the way, two is never achieved. Two is when the advantage is infinitely large. Okay, uh, so all of these grow faster. 
than than in, in mass action because they have these uh, laws with power two or larger. And the largest one actually is, is in the cylinder, okay? So the, uh, we can confirm these uh, things numerically. Uh, these are different uh, uh, simulations of different geometries. These are guide, uh, guides to the eye showing different slopes and uh, it works quite well. So uh, spatial structure and dimensionality significantly affect mutant evolution. Fragmentation works in a similar way as space. It gives you the same results even in the absence of uh, spatial distribution. It's just fragmentation. And uh, we have an intuitive explanation of why that is. Neutral and advantageous mutants are more abundant in spatial systems and disadvantageous mutants with higher death rates are more abundant in well-mixed systems. So I think I will skip over to the very last slide now, because I ran out of time. I want to show you this slide. There are a few things more fascinating than mathematics of evolution. I hope you agree with me on this. And I want to thank uh, uh, people uh, in my group and my uh, colleagues. I want to thank uh, uh, the agencies that fund our work. And uh, these are a couple of books that uh, you may look at. Uh, but as always, uh, the most interesting stuff is not in the books, it's the new stuff uh, that uh, uh, the new challenges that uh, we have to tackle. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, uh, Natalia, for your fascinating and stimulating talk. Thank There's you. definitely a lot of food to digest. And we have already a couple of questions. May I ask Sergey Tsuyev to put his question? Sergey, where are you? Uh, yes, I'm here. Hello. Where are you? In which country? I'm um, Sweden. I'm in Sweden. Sweden. Yep. Go often. Uh, <laughs> Good afternoon. Uh, so uh, the question was, uh, what is exactly the fitness? So you described a few systems, uh, and uh, but you kind of, uh, okay, uh, you did not mention exactly the mathematical definition of the fitness for you. Yeah. Uh, is it the property of a cell or is it popula population or? The uh, fitness is a, it's a good question and I skipped over many things. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to answer this. Let me find a slide. I think I may have a slide that does it. Um, the fitness is a property of a cell in the simplest, uh, so it depends on the model, right? So sure. any parameter is only makes sense uh, uh, in the context of a model. So uh, here in this very simple system when we have mutants that are characterized by fitness R, uh, this is relative to the fitness one of normal cells. Uh, you, you remove a cell and then you look for a cell to replace it with its offspring. The probability to divide is proportional to the fitness of each cell. So, we, so for example, the probability uh, of the normal cells to reproduce is given by the number of normal cells. It's proportional to the number of normal cells. The probability of mutants to reproduce is proportional to R times the number of mutants. So if R is bigger than one, they are disproportionately more likely to divide and take the place of a dead cell. So in this uh, system, this is an exact definition of fitness, uh, which, is, which scales with the probability to divide. You can also look at the probability to die. So you can, put, uh, you can express fitness through death rates. And there are many interesting phenomena that are observed depending on whether fitness is expressed through probability of division or death. Uh, in this rigid simulation, this is it. The other simulations uh, uh, include uh, non-constant populations. So for example, in the last part of the talk, we were, we were looking at growing populations of cells. Uh, there, we don't talk about replacement. Uh, we just have a propensity to divide and die. So a rate at which each cell, each cell divides uh, comprises its fitness. So if all cells have the same probability to die and they differ by their probability to divide, that's fitness. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> yep. Thank you. Thank you. And now we move to Mexico and we have a question by Josue Manik Nava Sedeño. 
Yosue, please ask your question. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so my question is, um, in some simulations, spatial simulations that you showed, um, you saw the development of certain batches of mutated cells. However, you said that in first mutation, probably the fitness goes down. So I was wondering, um, in the case where, where you considered that cells are not immediately replaced, uh, or that cells are not immediately replaced by new cells, um, could there be a formation of some apoptotic patch? So like the collapse of this patch that would prevent the further development of the second uh, mutation? I, I, I didn't hear you. I, 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 there were some interruptions that I, uh, I didn't hear exactly what you said. So you, you're talking about uh, a, simula a simulation uh, with uh, here, this one. Yes, yes, this exactly. One? Okay, mm -hmm. so here we start with a whole grid filled with cells, right? We'll let them divide and die. Uh, and uh, mm -hmm. so here they can divide anywhere. Here they can only divide next to them. And because of that, we get spatial structures. So mean field theory fails to describe this system. Actually, people use pair approximations, doesn't work very well but they are islands because of these spa spatial interactions. Uh, and you were saying, can there be apoptotic patches? Yeah, I mean, if the fitness is very low, if all of them die and create some apoptotic patch that um, affects the, the acquirement of the second mutation. So uh, you're right, so mutants die. Uh, they, they are disadvantageous, right? So they're... Uh, if they, uh, if they die, they're less likely to, uh, if a cell dies, these mutants are less likely to divide, to replace it. Uh, mm -hmm. So many of these patches will disappear before they had a chance to uh, acquire a new cell. Uh, they don't disappear and stay as empty holes because other cells divide into them, right? So it's, it, it's not gonna stay like an empty bubble, but uh, this is exactly the reason why evolution takes a long time uh, if, it, uh, if it has to go through an, a disadvantageous mutation. So the first step in the development of colon cancer, this is my first slide. Um, so this slide here, from here to here, inactivation of an APC gene, the two, two uh, step event, this takes 20 years. Mm -hmm. The next step takes five years and then shorter and shorter and shorter. Right. This is the longest step because evolution uh, that, that has to go through a valley takes a long time. So many of those the cells will die. And uh, it, 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 evolution takes many attempts before it manages to overcome this fitness valley. So, yeah. Okay. okay. Thank, you. Thank you. We have a question from Germany, Berlin by Simon Süger. In the last part, why do you consider growing populations that produce the mutants? Does cancer not typically arise in tissues that are already in homeostasis? Oh, that's a great question. So uh, as this example of colon cancer shows, absolutely, the first step happens in normal tissues. Uh, this, this was the first part of my talk. We consider a constant population. There is a cellular turnover. The population is constant homeostasis. As soon as homeostasis is broken by the first non-cooperative mutation that starts expanding, we cannot use constant population models anymore, right? We have to, for the, all the next steps, we consider growing populations. And most cancers take more than two steps. Uh, the only cancer that I know that takes only two steps is retinoblastoma. That's the uh, one of the first tumor. This is the first tumor suppressor gene that has been discovered. Uh, it only takes two events, the first and the second hit that inactivates the retinoblastoma gene. That's it. Most other cancers will have other mutational events. And this is why it's important to study growing populations. Uh, and how mutants uh, grow in them. Another application 
of studying mutations that arise in growing populations is treatment. So if you have a growing population of cells that undergoes uh, uh, treat uh, some chemical agents that kill cells, uh, mutants may arise that are resistant to treatment, right? So the, the, it's very important to know how these mutants uh, grow. So before treatment starts, we have a growing colony of cells that's expanding. That's before, before the, the person even knows that they have a cancer. Uh, inside that colony, there are resistant mutants that they don't know that they're resistant mutants. There is no treatment yet, but they, they will become resistance, resistant once the treatment is applied. Very often, these are disadvantageous mutants. Uh, under normal circumstances, they grow slower than normal cancer cells. Right? Uh, but once you start applying treatment, these are the cells that survive. These are the cells that defy treatment, and uh, they will give rise to a new wave of cancer. So these are the most dangerous things that are out there. So that's why we study disadvantageous mutants that arise in growing colonies uh, of cells. So thank you. We move now to India. We have a question from Raktim Kar. If we do not consider the passenger mutations in your model, what would be the effect? This relates to the part where you discuss driver and uh, passenger mutations. All right. Um, let's see. Um, here. Um, so I think this is the slide. Uh, if we, in the, in the, well, it's a theoretical construct to have a, um, a cancer without passenger mutations. So in this part of the talk, we studied exactly the effect of those passenger mutations. So we contrast two pathways. So here we don't allow passenger mutations and here we do, right? So uh, in the absence of passenger mutations, uh, there are only two events. The first and the second copy of the tumor suppressor gene is inactivated and the cell starts growing uh, at this stage. Uh, when we include passenger mutations, uh, there are passenger mutations that are created. They can be created here or here or even here. And the pathway goes like this. And it turns out that even though it includes more steps, it is faster. So the presence of those uh, harm, so-called harmless, unimportant passenger mutations actually accelerates cancer as much as the Lynch syndrome does. Thank you. I have a question uh, from Dresden. So uh, in the first part of your talk, you suggested that the stem cell hierarchical organization might uh, under or the results of your modeling with the slowest rate of evolution might suggest uh, an explanation for the organization of multicellular organisms. Uh, does this result speak against the so-called cancer stem cell hypothesis, which is discussed, for example, for certain glioma, because uh, there one would expect that the evolutionary rate should be quite fast. Uh, I don't think it speaks against that, no. So um, we are looking at uh, tissue structure, right? And uh, uh, if we were to engineer tissue and to think of the best organization of uh, cells, uh, how would we go about it, right? If we want to play evolution or God or whatever, how would we organize tissue such that mm -hmm. uh, it delays cancer as much as possible? So the, the suggestion uh, from a mathematical modeling would be to definitely have a hierarchical structure uh, we can even optimize the length of lineages. In the simple model that I showed today, there was only two types of cells, a stem cell and a differentiated cell. Uh, this is not the case, of course. In reality, we have stem cells that differentiate into different uh, stages or classes uh, of cells. There could be a, as many as seven 
maybe even more uh, different gradations of differentiation. So uh, tissue hierarchy is um, interesting and complex. Uh, we even tried to solve an optimization problem. How many stages of differentiation is optimal uh, to uh, delay cancer as much as possible? So this is what nature would do to delay cancer as much as possible. Now, cancers, of course, still happen. And when they do happen, uh, cancerous tissue retains many properties of healthy tissue uh, plus other properties, right? So if a cell is created that is cancerous cell, uh, some, some cancerous cells uh, kind of inherit the stemness of the or original cell. And they can differentiate and give, re give rise to like a bulk of the tumor that are not like differentiated cells. And what they say about those cells is that if you take those cells and plant them somewhere else, they won't give rise to a tumor. But only those uh, cancer, stem, uh, cancer cells that are stem cells, if you take them and replant them, they will originate the tumor. So this is kind of like a remnant of a normal tissue organization that cancers inherit. Uh, and uh, that uh, actually, it, it's an explanation of why cancer stem cells are there. So I don't think it, it contradicts that theory. It actually confirms it. Okay, thank you. So in uh, learning or better understanding cancer evolution, would you say it makes sense to look more deeper into the evolution of organisms or languages? Can we learn anything from there? I think what is your opinion? I, I think uh, it, it's interesting to work uh, in different systems that uh, all develop according to similar laws. Uh, and we draw on these similarities and uh, it gives us some insights uh, into, you know, different aspects of reality. So I, uh, I have worked on evolution of language uh, and I, uh, we tried to use Darwinian theory of evolution to describe uh, how languages evolve. Uh, you know, so I go back to Russia uh, after many years and there are words that people say that I do not understand, which means that the language has evolved uh, while I have been away. Uh, languages evolve. So how, how can we explain this? So these uh, innovations of language are like mutations uh, and some of them take and others don't. So maybe there's some fitness uh, component to, to, to those innovations. So we can describe languages by using the same formalism as we describe cancerous cells, as we describe viral evolution, uh, like the flu or HIV, cancer or evolution of species. So I, I find it fascinating that you can use mathematical, similar mathematical tools to describe such different phenomena. Thank you. We have uh, another question by Ottobild. Are in vivo growth rates large enough to lead to demographic effects on the site frequency spectrum? e.g. population expansion mimicking selection in a neutral population of cells. Can you please repeat this? Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't catch it. Are in vivo growth rates large enough to lead to demographic effects on the site frequency spectrum? O o of the site, site frequency si spectrum? Site, fr site frequency spectrum. I don't know what that means. Uh, nor do I. Maybe Otwild, can you uh, put your question into the? We have. We can. Uh, uh, we can actually um, maybe ask him directly if Otwild puts his question into the Zoom chat. But uh, another uh, possibility, Otwild, is that you put your question via email to Natalia. Because we have, in the interest of time, come to the end of our seminar today. I would first like to thank again to Natalia. Thank and you. then uh, would like to share my screen. Uh, because next week we will have another talk by Marek Kimmel. He will speak about side frequency spectra and related statistics and inference of tumor evolution. With that, I am 
looking forward to see uh, many of you next week. There, you know, there is a Slack possibility to continue discussion. And with that, I wish you a nice day, a nice evening, and a nice week. Good morning. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Thanks. Goodbye. <laughs>